ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Spring Data Project Lead, Pivotal, Ollie Gierke, and Spring Framework Committer, Pivotal, Rasen Stoyanchov. Hi, I'm Rasen. And I'm Oli. I'm here to talk about reactive features in Spring MVC. And I'll be covering the data side of things and actually have an exciting announcement to make. Would you like to make it now? Uh, you know, Rasen, they say best comes last. So uh, why don't you go first, and I'll be back in a second. All right. Almost exactly one year ago, Spring Framework 5 delivered comprehensive support for reactive programming. In plain words, that means building asynchronous, non-blocking applications that scale and are resilient under load with, while using less resources. A few short days later, Spring Data K dropped support for reactive data repositories. And just ahead of Spring 1 uh, in December, Spring Security provided reactive bits as well. Finally, in February of this year, Spring Boot 2.0 uh, gave us a way to run a full stack reactive application in an easy way. And today, we have Spring Cloud Functions, Spring Cloud Gateway building on these reactive features, as well as Spring Cloud Finchley. But how ready are you for this change? Can you justify switching to a whole new stack? Or are you still trying to figure out how does all of this relate to you and to your applications? And how can you benefit? Myself included in the past, we've talked a lot about Spring Web Flux and running on a full reactive stack. And that makes sense, because this is the way to make the most of an event loop concurrency non-blocking model uh, to benefit from that efficiency. We've talked about ground groundbreaking things like running on non-servlet containers, asynchronous runtimes like Netty and Undertow. Or perhaps if you'd like to stay on a servlet container, you can use Tomcat or Jetty with servlet 3.1 non-blocking I.O., a completely different foundation. We've talked about reactive programming models. We even have a functional a programming model for web endpoints. But what we haven't talked about as much is reactive features in Spring MVC, which is what most of you are using today. How can we add value to existing applications, and how can we get started in this topic of reactive programming uh, and get some immediate benefits without the risk of going directly to a full reactive stack? So in Spring MVC, um, we, we have uh, the servlet API, and the framework was built originally for a synchronous uh, blocking uh, programming model. However, for a long time, we've had async, the ability to process requests asynchronously. Um, and we can decouple from the servlet container thread, and we can do all of the handling in the controller independent of the servlet container thread. And that means that we can use reactive handling in the controller, and this is something that Spring MVC supports uh, from uh, version 5.0. Let's take a look at an example to make this more clear. Suppose we have a shopping site. One of the things we may need to do um, for a given product is to look up a list of suppliers uh, who can provide this product. For each supplier, we will make an HTTP call uh, to obtain product price info. And finally, we may also contact or uh, query a local database in order to find any discounts uh, that we've negotiated with those suppliers. And I know that the microservice experts in the audience are going to tell me that we should not be making all these calls immediately. And you would be absolutely correct. However, as we all know, in the real world, we don't always have a choice over what external APIs we need to call. So if we have to make these calls, how would we actually do that today? In Spring MVC, it would be relatively simple. Uh, we would create a controller method that returns a list of product offers. Uh, we would make one call to the supplier URL uh, remote service. And we would get back a list of uh, suppliers. And then we're going to turn that into a Java 8 stream. Uh, 
Uh, we're going to make a second call uh, to the supplier URL. And finally, we will also make a call to the database using a repository to find the discounts. All of this is simple, but it comes with a price. And the price is the inefficient execution. As you can see here, it results in waterfall uh, sequential uh, execution. And uh, some of these calls may take one, two, or more seconds. So if we add them all together, we may end up with a request that takes eight or nine seconds or more. So how would we do this with reactive handling? This is also Spring MVC. Uh, but this time, we're going to return a flux instead of a list. And the flux is a deferred structure, which means that we're not actually going to execute immediately, uh, not until the controller method returns, and something, which in this case is Spring MVC, is going to subscribe uh, to that flux. That's what's going to trigger the handling. So we are going to declare what needs to be done, but the actual processing is going to start only once there is a subscriber. So the first thing is we're also going to make a call to the supplier remote service. And this is a non-blocking call, which means that it's not going to sit there and wait for the result. Uh, but instead, it's going to push the data as it becomes available. And we're going to use this uh, then to make two more asynchronous calls. And you can see here that they're returning mono, which is also a deferred structure. We're going to get a discount as well. And finally, we're going to take these two um, promises for the data to come, we're going to zip them together, and then we're going to return that as a single flux, uh, a stream of product offers. As you can see, we are not writing that many more lines of code. This may be something new, or maybe you can relate to the Java 8 Stream API. Uh, however, the bottom line is that we have e efficient execution. Uh, as you can see, half the overall time, first of all. Um, the product sellers we have to obtain initially, once that information comes, we can um, send out those requests concurrently. And when I say we, it's actually the code that's doing it for you. As you saw on the previous slide in the example, we didn't actually do anything with threads. We didn't do anything with an executor. All of that is handled efficiently. We simply declare the pipeline of what needs to be done. And the other thing which is really important is that this is executed in a really scalable and efficient way. By default, the web client uses React and Netty, which relies on four threads in total in order to execute all of this. So if we have many requests on the server, all of those making these remote calls are going to be handled with a very small number of threads, uh, which is using a lot less resources than a traditional classic style of using the REST template. Of course, um, none of this is actually new. As I said, Spring Framework 5 released uh, one year ago. We do have something important to share today. In fact, for the discerning ones in the audience, there was something in the example uh, which is uh, a surprise. And for that, I'm going to turn it over to Oliver. Thank you, Russell. All right. So I would like to direct your attention uh, to that, or these two lines of code here. Th this is a Spring Data repository invocation, and it's a reactive one, as you can see from the, from the method return type. And uh, Spring Data has shipped support for reactive data access for uh, MongoDB, for Redis, for Couchbase, and Cassandra with the K release train last year. But if you watched Rosten's architecture slide closely before, you've noticed that it didn't actually say no SQL, right? It said SQL. So what are the options in the Spring Data space to actually implement uh, data access for relational databases these days? Uh, first and foremost, there is the Spring Data JPA project. It's by far the biggest project in terms of download numbers. It's built on top of JPA, uh, the Java Persistence API, which is a quite convenient way to access your database and map your Java objects onto the relational database and execute queries. However, that convenience comes at a cost of uh, getting some indirection between you, the application developer, and the actual execution of uh, SQL code. And as a lot of developers like to get back that kind of control, We've always integrated with libraries like Juke and Query DSL to give you exactly that control back. 
as a continuation of giving you that control back, we've just shipped a new Spring Data module last week, which is uh, Spring Data JDBC, which sort of makes this control front and center. So you get more fine-grained control about the object mapping and uh, the JDBC query execution, actually. Right? But as you can see, both of these modules are based on JDBC, which is a fundamentally blocking API. So it raises the questions, what can you do to actually uh, execute those queries in an asynchronous fashion? And it's not something that we've never, uh, anyone has ever thought about. Uh, in fact, there are a couple of projects out there in the Java space that actually deal with this problem. First and foremost, there's the Rx Java, JDB, um, Rx Java 2 JDBC project that sort of takes the approach to offload the execution of those uh, JDBC interactions into a different thread and a thread pool, and it decorates that with a nice um, reactive API. However, although there's a reactive API, you don't necessarily get all the features because you're fundamentally inter still interacting with a blocking API. Around about Two years ago, the JDBC expert group started to talk about a potential alternative to JDBC at Java 1 conference the year uh, after they did that again. And in last summer, they started to actually work more seriously or at least opened up their efforts to the greater public. And we sort of started to get into conversations, chimed in on the mailing list, that we'd like to see even more reactive features in that new uh, API. However, they're sort of constrained as that new API has to actually work on pure JDK APIs and um, is actually based on a uh, completable future. So it's still lacking exactly the properties we want to get, like streaming access and back pressure. So in December last year, we started to explore this space in more detail. And I'm excited uh, to be able to announce a new project we actually coined uh, called R2DBC which is short for uh, Reactive Relational Database Connectivity. It's a fully reactive JDBC alternative so that you can access your relational databases in a reactive way. What does that project actually look like? Um, it's probably not that different, or as you expect, not that different from JDBC. We have a core SPI that database vendors can actually implement to uh, yeah, to support that, we went ahead and already provide an implementation for Postgres database so um, that you can just out of the box talk to a Postgres database in reactive fashion. We are, of course, in touch with other database vendors that, at Microsoft, at Google, uh, to also support that API. And if you're, like, by accident, uh, an implementer of, a, let's say, asynchronous driver to any of these other databases, uh, feel free to get in touch. We'd love to get your feedback and potentially get you involved. What we're also still doing, of course, is monitor the, uh, the work that the ADBA guys are actually doing. Uh, there have been, has been some development recently that they sort of investigate uh, the use of the Flow APIs that are available uh, since uh, JDK 9, I think. Um, for now, we just provide an adapter so that you can uh, use an ADBA implementation uh, underneath the R2DBC uh, APIs. Of course, then again, giving up um, the uh, features like uh, SQL streaming and um, back pressure. On top of the SPI, we also build a kind of client API. Imagine JDBC template, but in a more reactive fashion. So the API looks much more like uh, um, the web client in Spring Web Flux. And um, the SPI is based on reactive streams API, so that you're basically free to choose uh, any kind of reactive library to implement both the database driver or any other client, client API on top of that. So now that we sort of have the infrastructure bits out of the way, uh, we've, of course, didn't stop there and um, build a JDBC, a Spring Data module on top of that. So and that's what you actually saw in the example, right? So you saw an R2DBC repository being used, and it just looks like any other Spring Data reactive repository that you might be familiar with from, let's say, using MongoDB or Redis. So it's a reactive CRUD repository and has a query method that just takes that SQL query and executes that and returns a model. The client API looks 
somewhat similar. So there's even support, uh, preliminary support for transactions in there. You just create a, a, that client from the connection factory, and then uh, that, um, that, that client actually takes a Lambda to execute uh, a couple of chunks of, of SQL. So you have the SQL, bind the parameter, and then execute it. That's, of course, not necessarily the way you'd expect to use transactions in a, a Spring application. So we're currently working with the Spring Framework team to bring add transactional support to, to that uh, programming model so that any method that returns a flux and is annotated with, uh, with add transactional would automatically get the transactional behavior applied. Find out more about the project at r2dbc.io. Um, the example code that um, Rosson and I talked about is up in my personal GitHub for you to play with. And uh, we also have uh, R2DBC examples in the canonical Spring Data examples repository. If you want to learn more about this stuff at the conference itself, I highly recommend to join a Ben Hale session. Sorry for flooding your room, Ben. Um, and also, the entire data team is on site. So Christoph, Jens, and Mark are going to uh, cover all the other uh, things, data with Jens on the, on the new JDBC stuff, so if you're interested in that. All right, that's it. Thank you very much.